go through the calculation of the Hamiltonian uh, in this uh, second lecture. Uh, but the first task at hand, the first uh, thing that we really need to do is to re-express the gravitational action in a way that incorporates the 3 plus 1 decomposition. So I want to basically stack this up in terms of, you know, rewrite the, uh, the full space-time integral in terms of a bunch of spatial integrations on each hypersurface, and then an integration over T that will take up, you know, that will uh, take, up, you know, take us from one hypersurface to the next. So we're going to have to do it for the bulk term. We're going to have to do it for the uh, surface terms. And when we left off, I was just telling you that, well, keeping track of the boundary terms here is going to be essential because uh, in the end, uh, you know, the Hamiltonian is going to care very much about what the boundary terms are doing in all this. So, uh, and as I told you this morning, so there's a lot of bookkeeping that's, uh, that's going to be involved here. So uh, what I'm going to do now is to just starting out all, you know, writing up all the uh, embedding relations that are involved in doing all of this. And as you see, what we have to do it all very systematically. So, are relevant for, uh, for this guy. This is a constant t, where t is our time function. So vector. And we have the tangent vectors that are just Uh, the intrinsic coordinates. We have an induced of the normal vector projected down to the hypersurface. Tells us that the force, you know, the four-dimensional metric a piece that's normal and a piece that's uh, transverse, and a piece that's transverse, of course. action. So that's one set of embed uh, relate to uh, sigma t. And that's sigma
function equal to zero on uh, that tell us that curves within terms of two intrinsic coordinates theta a and those relations over here basically describe curves within uh, sigma t. Uh, here we had three coordinates, here we have two, so it's a two-dimensional uh, surface, it's a closed uh, surface that's two-dimensional, and we have those parametric relations within it. We have this guy here defining the uh, normal vector, and the normal vector of st embedded in sigma t I'm going to call ra. And ra is going to be proportional to the gradient of that uh, scalar function. And we also have tangent vectors that are going to be defined in the three-dimensional surface, uh, which are going to be given by partial derivatives of the intrinsic coordinates in sigma t relative to the intrinsic coordinates in st. So all of this is just the same pattern, uh, but, uh, you know, one dimension down. So nothing very, uh, very surprising. Here is just the same thing. We're going to have an induced metric in st, the same way that we had an induced metric in sigma t. So the induced metric here, my notation, is going to be sigma AB, and here it's important not to confuse ourselves. This is not a shear tensor, it's really a metric uh, within ST. So this is the induced metric that's going to be given by the inner product of all the tangent vectors, those inner products being defined with the appropriate metric, which is the three-dimensional metric within, um, uh, within ST, within sigma T. And uh, on top of that, we're going to have an extrinsic curvature. And here I have to distinguish all the extrinsic curvatures that we're, we're going to be dealing with in, in, this, uh, in this reduction here. So this is going to be a lowercase k with indices a, b, upper case. And that's going to be defined as the covariant derivative of the normal vector projected down to the two-dimensional surface. So it's just the exact analog to what we had before. Uh, before, of course, we had covariant derivatives compatible with the spacetime metric. Here we have covariant derivatives relative to, uh, to the spatial metric HAB. And in the same way we had a completeness relation before, well, the exact analogous thing here is going to be a decomposition of HAB in terms of a normal piece, which now is in the direction of ST's normal vector. There's a plus sign here because that vector is space-like, not uh, time-like. And then there's a decomposition involving the inverse sigma metric and tangent vectors. So again, I think nothing very surprising here is just the same sort of thing where now we're looking at st being a boundary to sigma t and having uh, all the usual embedding relations that are appropriate uh, in this circumstance. So this is the two-dimensional extrinsic curvature, the two-dimensional metric, and here we have three-dimensional uh, things up here. Now here I've chosen to uh, embed ST uh, within, its, uh, you know, within sigma t. So ST is being embedded in a three-dimensional surface, but I can look at each sigma, uh, st, look at each one of those two-dimensional, uh, you know, submanifolds here. I can look at this as being embedded directly in space-time. So I can come up with an alternative set of embedding relations that would tell me how to embed that two-dimensional surface directly into a four-dimensional space-time. And of course, you know, it's not going to be vastly different from what we've done here, but instead of formulating everything in terms of uh, two-dimensional quantities within a three-dimensional embedding, it's going to be a bunch of two-dimensional quantities uh, formulated directly in terms of a four-dimensional embedding. So that's a little bit new, that's a little bit uh, different from what we've done before, but uh, I'll just do it and you'll see how it goes. The idea is that while we can do it in two steps the way we've done here, st is embedded in sigma t and sigma t is embedded in space-time, and we can combine those two steps 
and end up with the formalism where ST is embedded directly in space-time. So we're just going to combine these things into an embedding of ST directly in uh, space-time. So I think I'm going to keep this up. I'm just going to introduce one more thing here. Uh, we have the normal vector on each hypersurface, sigma t, we don't know that r alpha, uh, n alpha. Uh, the normal vector to b, which is going to be the same thing as the normal vector to s t embedded in sigma t, is going to be a four-dimensional vector, r alpha, which is going to be basically the space-time uh, space analog to what we have right here. So let me keep this over here, and I'll move over there. So the next step is to do, uh, as I said, we're going to embed ST embedded in space-time. Yep? This would just our, that defining um, our normal down there, is that an alpha or is that an, an A? This is A. Okay. I'm going to convert into a, an alpha in just a second. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, uh, that's all intrinsically, uh, you know, that's an embedding in three dimensions, so all those indices are all uh, three-dimensional indices. Okay, so how do I embed a two-dimensional surface in space-time? Well, you pretty much do exactly the same thing. You come up with a scalar <coughs> function that will vanish on the two-surface, and you come up with parametric relations that will describe curves, in that two surface, but now all of those descriptions uh, refer to the four-dimensional space-time and not that three-dimensional uh, you know, surface that we were starting with uh, on that side of the board. So the defining relation in this case is going to be, there I called it phi, here I'll call it psi, it's going to be some function of the four space-time coordinates that will vanish on that two-dimensional surface. So again, very, uh, very simple. And the, uh, the parametric relations are going to be a bunch of relations between the space-time coordinates and the two-dimensional coordinate system that we are placing on ST. And it's pretty easy to get these things. That's the two-step process that I talked about. We can get those equations by just, first of all, recalling the parametric equations that refer to sigma t itself, and then in that, formulating the parametric equations that describe uh, curves in sigma t. So those are the parameter curves uh, for st within sigma t, and that's, you know, in a two-step process, in, you know, uh, describing this in space-time. So anyway, so those relations over here are just the same thing as, you know, combining the functional relations that we have in the two-step process. So pretty straightforward. Uh, the normal vector here is going to be um, defined in terms of the gradient of that thing, but I'll come back to that in a second. The tangent vectors are going to be derivatives of the space-time coordinates with respect to the intrinsic coordinates in the two-dimensional surface. And these guys I can get by first calculating the partial derivatives with respect to Ya and then applying the train rule to calculate the, uh, the derivatives in a two-step process. And that means that I can get those tangent vectors by first calculating the three-dimensional tangent vectors on sigma t, and then projecting those uh, with an st. So that's the you know, one-step process, that's the two-step process, and of course all of this is compatible. The normal vector, the one that I would get from calculating this gradient and normalizing, uh, well, would have to agree with this vector. I mean, we are talking about the same normal vector, except that here I'm giving it the three-dimensional uh, you know, description, and over there I want to give it a four-dimensional description, but we're talking about the same normal vector. It has the same norm, it has the same direction, it has to be the same vector. And uh, the way it has to be, then, is that this uh, normal vector will be the old normal vector basically promoted to a four-dimensional uh, vector. So this would be the push forward of the three-dimensional vector in space-time 
using the tangent vectors as, uh, as the tool to do the push forward. Uh, the induced metric, if we do the embedding directly in space-time, the induced metric is going to be, of course, um, well, well, anyway, I can get it from what we had over there. So it's going to be HAB projected down, but HAB is also given by uh, these guys over here. So it's going to be G alpha beta, E alpha A, E beta B projected down to the two-dimensional surface. And, uh, you know, by taking, by using those relationships over here, I find that this is the space-time metric projected fully down to the two-dimensional surface. So the, uh, you know, these products here end up giving me those uh, tangent vectors going from four dimensions to two dimensions. So that's how we get the uh, induced metric. Uh, the extrinsic curvature, I can do something uh, exactly uh, analogous to this. Now, one thing I didn't talk about much in the lectures, in fact, I didn't talk about this, uh, you know, well, I didn't, I, I, I didn't even mention it in the lectures, but, um, but you will have seen this if, you, uh, if you've read the relevant sections of the book. Uh, one thing that uh, we can do is to relate these intrinsic uh, covariant derivatives to those that refer to derivatives of this vector in space-time. So uh, one thing we didn't talk about in the lecture, but you can see a full discussion of this in the book, is that RAB defined intrinsically to the three-dimensional surface ends up being the same thing as the covariant derivatives of the four-dimensional version of that vector projected down to the hypersurface. And in fact, you can view this as, as a definition. And in the book, that's how I, you know, define these things. In the lectures, I did it differently. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, you can regard this as a definition of intrinsic covariant derivatives. It's just the full covariant derivatives with the, you know, with the connection compatible with a space-time metric fully projected down to the, uh, to the hypersurface. So I just want to, uh, well, basically pretend that I'm recalling this from a previous lecture, even though I never mentioned it. Uh, explicitly, but you know, hopefully you guys have kept up to, with your reading uh, over the weeks, and you know uh, what I'm talking about. So that's just to uh, to say that uh, the extrinsic curvature, the two-dimensional extrinsic curvature, uh, could be defined in this way. But now we can uh, basically incorporate this and say that this is the covariant derivative of the four-dimensional vector. projected once, projected twice. And that turns out to be, well, the same thing as the covariant derivative in space-time of the four-dimensional normal vector fully projected down from space-time to uh, the two-dimensional surface. So that's what we do. Uh, no, that's how we define a two-dimensional extrinsic curvature when we do in the embedding, the embedding directly in space-time. And the last thing I can write down is a completeness relation. So the completeness relation for the full metric is going to have a piece that's going to be normal to sigma t. And then what I'm going to do, what I'm going to do is to plug this into here, and we'll have a piece that's going to be normal to, uh, you know, along the, uh, the radial normal, the R normal, and then there's going to be a piece here that's going to be fully uh, uh, tangent to the two-dimensional surface. So the, um, so the completeness relation in this case is going to be minus n alpha n beta plus r alpha r beta. So that comes directly from plugging um, that, sorry, plugging uh, this, where am I? Uh, plugging this into here. So the first term is r a multiplying the tangent vector that promotes r a to r alpha. Same thing here. And then we have this guy that we plug into here, and that will turn that into sigma AB, E alpha A, E beta B. So that's a completeness relation in space-time involving quantities defined on ST 
that two-dimensional surface embedded in, uh, in space-time. So anyway, so the point about this here is that once you've embedded a two-dimensional surface into a three-dimensional hypersurface, which is itself embedded in space-time, well, you can you know, combine these two steps into one step and work out the embedding from, you know, from the point of view of the two-dimensional surface embedded directly in space-time. And that's something we're going to need in, uh, in, in this uh, development over there. All right? No big uh, myster uh, mysteries at this point? OK. So one more set of embedding relations that we're going to need here is the embedding of B as a hypersurface in space-time. So that's the next step, and the next step after that, uh, before we get going for real, is going to be to foliate B into those STs that we just talked about. So now the next step is to have B, the boundary B, embedded in space-time. So again, we're going to have a complete listing of embedding relations. And we're going to have yet another extrinsic curvature that's now going to be defined on B instead of being defined on uh, sigma T or ST. That one is also going to be a three-dimensional um, extrinsic curvature. So again, we have a defining relations. So let's see, I'm running out of letters. So I'll call it uh, C of um, X alpha is going to be 0 on the boundary B, on the, on the rim. Uh, on the cylinder, you know, cylinder part of the uh, of the boundary, we're going to have uh, we're going to have the parametric relations that will describe curves uh, within B. So Z i here are going to be my intrinsic coordinates on B. So my parametric relations are going to be equations of the form um, where x alpha is given as a function of the three parameters Z i on um, on my, uh, on my surface B. Uh, from this, we're going to have the normal vector, which of course has to be the same uh, normal vector that we've been talking about. So uh, R alpha is going to be proportional to the gradient of that function. And uh, it has to agree with the other normal vector that we talked about, because clearly a normal to ST is also going to be a normal to uh, to, uh, to B because, you know, ST is just a restriction to one time of this, uh, of this whole boundary B. So the normal to ST has to agree with the normal to R. We're talking about exactly the same, uh, the same normal vector. So we have that. The tangent vectors on B are going to be, again, partial derivatives of the space-time coordinates with respect to the intrinsic coordinates. The induced metric, this one I'm going to call gamma ij. That's going to be the space-time metric projected down. And the extrinsic curvature, uh, here the notation on the board is going to look horrible. In the book, it's called curly k. So I'm going to try to you know, write down a curly k, but I can't control that very well. Um, curly k challenged. Uh, the extrinsic curvature is going to be a three-dimensional thing that's going to involve the covariant derivatives of the normal vector projected down to the surface. So that's a, you know, yet another uh, extrinsic curvature that we're going to need in all this. And we have a completeness relation, again, that will involve the normal direction and the tangential directions through gamma ij. So all of this is just more of the same. It's the same, you know, it's the same listing in all cases. But it's important here to, uh, to do the bookkeeping. That's what I meant by doing the bookkeeping that you keep track of all the different notations that refer to very different uh, situations. Because when we put it all together uh, in a few minutes, uh, it's going to be easy to be confused unless you have a very clean 
you know, a listing of all the quantities and what they mean and, you know, and a specific notation um, uh, for that. All right. Okay. The last thing I'm going to do before we actually get going is to uh, actually foliate B with those surfaces ST. That's what they're for. Uh, and I want to uh, just basically continue to formulate the, fo uh, the foliation. So I'm not going to be able to keep all the, uh, all the equations on the board here. Are there any questions that we should? Uh, any questions I could clear up? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, what was the question? That was Okay. No, so I'm wondering about. Uh, so are you just wondering about the like our a bar b with the uh, the covariant derivative on. The three surface. Oh, this one here? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Just look right there, where it is. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. So you're okay with that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So let's do the uh, foliation of B. So, B is foliated uh, by STs. So let me draw a piece of B. So this is B. This will be ST1. This will be ST0. And this will be you know, a generic ST uh, in the middle. And I've already told you that we're going to have coordinates theta a uh, on st at any given time. And one thing that we need to think about is, well, the issue that we raised uh, in the morning. So in principle, I can set up coordinate systems on each st independently without having a relationship between them. But of course, it would be inconvenient to do that. It's much better to come up with some ways of uh, relating the, uh, the theta a coordinates from one st to the next to the next and so on. So this morning we did that with a congruence of curves. Those curves were defined in the bulk. Now uh, we're going to need to do it uh, with curves that are defined on the boundary. And they may be exactly the same curves we were dealing with before, but it could be that the boundary is not tied to the congruence itself. It could be that the boundary is not, you know, is not generated by the, by the curves that we had before. So here we have the freedom of coming up with a brand new congruence in order to do the foliation of ST within B. Uh, and uh, well, no, it really doesn't matter. Either you know, either we do it fresh, or we just you know insist that the boundary B should be tied to the initial congruence. It doesn't really matter. We might as well do it fresh. It doesn't matter whether they're tied or not. We might as well just come up with. Uh, a new congruence that's going to be the job of telling us what theta a will be um, as I move up uh, the sts going along b. So what we're going to do is to introduce a new congruence of curves on t on b along which uh, theta a is constant. But this time, just to keep life simple, because here we don't really care about maintaining all the freedom we had in the morning, for the purposes of just doing the foliation on B, I can restrict my, uh, my freedom uh, quite a bit. And in fact, I'll restrict my freedom. I'll say that this new congruence is going to be orthogonal to, uh, to ST. So the new curves are going to be orthogonal to all the STs on the boundary. I can do that. Uh, there's no harm in doing this. And it will save me a little bit of work. If I do that, I don't have to do it. I couldn't maintain the freedom that we had in the morning. But in this case, there's no particular advantage in doing this. So basically, those details eventually will just disappear from our site. So we might as well do something simple, because in the end, those details will not matter very much. 
So, uh, so my curves, for example, will go orthogonal, uh, will, will be orthogonal to all the STs. So it starts here and it goes through here. And in each case, we have uh, a curve that crosses the hypersurface orthogonally and it will do it on all of those in between as well. So we have this network of curves and we have theta A down here being carried along the curve so that theta A here will match with the theta A up here. And now we have a relationship between, uh, between all the intrinsic coordinate systems on all the SDs being carried forward by this new congruence that we're introducing here. Uh, the congruence by choice is going to be orthogonal to ST to ST within B. The curve, of course, are all contained within B. And basically, uh, the construction here is identical to what we did in the morning, except that now we're restricting ourselves to a zero shift. So all the relations that we worked out before between the normal vector and you know, the flow vector that's defined by the congruence continue to apply. Uh, but uh, now uh, we don't have to impose, we don't have a shift vector. The shift vector will be zero in this case. So, um, for example, This vector over here that corresponds to a displacement along each curve because I keep theta A equal constant, well, that's going to be the tangent vector to the flow. And that will be, in this case, aligned with the normal vector, which is going to be, I shouldn't use this notation because I've used it before. I'll just use this notation. Now it's aligned with the normal vector, and it's going to be basically given by a relationship like this. So I'm still using the time function as a good parameter along this new congruence. And as I move up the congruence, keeping theta a constant, you know, moving along each curve, uh, now I'm basically moving along the normal direction. And the coefficient in front here is still, uh, is still the lapse function. But now we have a zero shift in this, you know, in this, uh, in this case. Uh, we still have that n alpha is going to be, you know, proportional to, uh, to the gradient of the time function. And, uh, and basically all the other relationships that we worked out uh, before. Uh, what I want to do now is to, uh, well, basically put all this together and uh, I'll make a choice. I'll make a choice of coordinates for my zi coordinates. You know, I've already introduced all sorts of coordinates here, and in principle, I could keep those coordinates distinct from anything else I've introduced. But what I'm going to do is to just assume that those coordinates are going to be combined, you know, they're going to be made up of T and sigma A. So I can make this choice, and it's going to be convenient to make this choice. You have a question? You have a question. Are these the same as before, or are these the new ones that are orthogonal to our? Uh, Sequence. Yeah, so this C is still the same uh, time function that we introduced in the morning. So, oh. and so we still have, so, you know, the time function is defined everywhere in the bulk and also on the boundary, so that, you know, carries over. The, uh, so the curves here are new, but I still parameterize those curves with the same T we used, uh, we used before, uh, we used, uh, you know, that, that we did before in the morning. So in the morning I had a different congruence of curves. I still use T as a parameter on those curves. The only distinction here is that all well, these curves are defined purely on B, and they're chosen to be orthogonal to, uh, to ST uh, everywhere on, on the bottom. So the, the, the only essential point here is that I can't really assume that this is going to be the same uh, congruence that we had in the morning, because there's nothing here that tells me that the boundary has to be tied to the behavior of the initial congruence, the, the original congruence. The boundary can cut across those curves. There's nothing that tells me that the boundary has to be tuned to the behavior of the original congruence we had in the morning. So, I mean, I can make this choice. I can, I can tie, you know, I can choose to tie the, uh, the generators, the flow lines that we introduced in the morning to the boundary. That would certainly simplify this discussion a bit. But uh, there's nothing that compels me to do that. And in fact, the boundary can be quite independent 
from, uh, from those congruences that we had in the morning. So that's why I have to come up with a new congruence. And here, the choice that I make is to make it as simple as I can by, you know, uh, by you know, adopting the same parameterization, but also making the curves orthogonal to ST uh, as I move up the boundary. Question? Uh, I mean, it's always been something about more obvious things than the fluid, but it's, it's not obvious yet to me why you feel allowed to make that choice here, but not, but not in the bulk. Because, I mean, you said that, that what we'll find is that the Hamiltonian actually only gets contribution from the boundary term. So it would almost seem like two is like, like, like not triggering ourselves on the boundary, but it would be more important than not triggering ourselves in the bulk. Um, can you talk more about why exactly we can make this choice here? Um, and we couldn't before. Okay, uh, so two things. So first of all, we can always make the choice. It's just that in, in, the, you know, in the discussion of this morning, I didn't want to make it because it would be a restriction in the degrees of, in, in the freedom that we have in setting up the coordinates. Uh, we could insist that we're, we're going to retain all this choice in this context here, and in fact, we could insist that the ZIs will be a completely independent set of coordinates. And we could certainly you know, generalize this to introduce a new shift vector for this congruence. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, if you're not satisfied with this, you, know, you can al always do it on the side. Uh, the bottom line is that uh, we, so we already have the, all the freedom we need. And this would be basically redundant freedom that we don't, we don't really need. I mean, it's not entirely obvious. It's something that you, know, you sort of need to work through in order to, con to convince yourself. But the bottom line is that the details of this uh, of this foliation will sort of disappear from sight. Okay. And we still have the freedom that we set up in the morning where we have a completely independent, you know, a completely freely uh, specifiable lapse and shift vectors. We could introduce more of that here, but it's not, it's not essential. It's not, it's not useful. It doesn't, it won't, it won't generate new freedom. It's just, you know, it's just redundant freedom. But thanks for the question. It's uh, certainly not obvious why we're allowed to do it here and we were not allowed to do it before. Okay. So now let me do the next bit, which is to say that we're going to choose Zi to be identical to T and theta A. So I already have my two-dimensional coordinates on each, uh, on each uh, ST. I know that I can move up on the rim by, uh, by varying t, so I might as well uh, choose those coordinates that will simplify the, the, the description. And uh, what I've done here is to introduce basically uh, you know, a rigidity, you know, some form of rigidity between the coordinates I use here versus the coordinates I use here and the coordinates I use anywhere uh, along the way. So Z naught is going to be, uh, you know, T and Z, you know, spatial are going to be the theta A, co uh, theta A coordinates. Okay, so we're going to do that. And uh, what I want to do now is to just go back to those relations over here and specialize them to this choice of intrinsic coordinates. So I want to calculate the induced metric in terms of, uh, you know, objects that will recognize when I choose the intrinsic coordinates ZI to be these over here. So that's the purpose here of, uh, of going through the next, uh, the next steps. So if I, have, if I consider a displacement on B, well, I know that the displacement on B can be decomposed into a displacement along T, keeping theta A fixed and a displacement along theta A, keeping T fixed. And uh, over here, of course, I recognize these guys as being the, uh, the tangent vectors. So this is going to be uh, the guy we just, uh, you know, we just constructed up here. So this is the flow vector along the new congruence. And that goes along the normal vector. And these guys, of course, go along the, uh, those are the tangent vectors, E, A, E alpha A, and those are the displacements along uh, uh, the theta directions. Uh, this, is, this is a normal vector to, the, uh, to, the, uh, to each ST. The, these are tangent vectors to each ST. So those vectors are orthogonal to each other. 
if I calculate a ds squared restricted to b, I have the same sort of calculation we had this morning. And combining these things, I don't have any cross terms because, again, this is orthogonal to this. So I multiply this and that. I get n squared, and I get a minus 1 because n is a time-like uh, normal vector that, uh, that's normalized. So the first term I get is n squared dt squared with a minus sign. And then when I multiply those guys together, I get g, I get e alpha a, e alpha b, and according to my embedding relations from up here, that, uh, that defines the uh, induced metric sigma AB on each ST surface. And that is basically a description of the three-dimensional metric on, on, um, on, um, on B. So one way of writing it out here is to say that uh, in this choice of coordinates, gamma ij, um, dz i, dz j, is equal to minus n squared dt squared plus sigma a b, d theta a, d theta b. So that's a way of expressing the induced metric on b in terms of things we can recognize, like the lapse function and the metric on each ST surface. All right? According to this, the determinant of that metric is going to be equal to the lapse multiplying the two-dimensional determinant of the two-dimensional metric. So that's a consequence of all of this. And here it's even easier to see because we don't have cross terms in the metric, so, uh, so it's a simpler relationship. And at some point down the road, I'm not going to do it right away, but at some point down the road, we're going to be dealing with this extrinsic curvature. And, of course, we're going to use those tangent vectors that we just worked out, uh, those guys over here, in order to express the, uh, curva the uh, extrinsic curvature in terms of, again, quantities we, uh, we recognize. Okay. The good news is that uh, we're done with the bookkeeping. Uh, now we can just put it all together, go back to the gravitational action, and just write it in a way that is conducive to extracting the Hamiltonian. Uh, the bad news, of course, is that there's a lot of stuff to remember here. Uh, in the book, I provided a table to keep track of all these things because there's just many of them. Uh, but uh, again, the good news is that, well, now we're done. We can just apply these things. And I hope you find that, well, it's not too formidable that, you know, it's more or less a repetition of all the same steps. Uh, it's just that there are lots of pieces to the boundary. There are lots of ways you can embed these things. And, uh, and then there's, you know, foliations all over the place. So, <laughs> so there's a lot going on. But, uh, but uh, again, we're done with that. Now we can move on and do, uh, and do the rest of it. Any questions before I go to the next step? Okay, so let's do the next step. The next step is to go back to the gravitational action and see what we're dealing with. Okay, I wrote down the gravitational action up here, but we're going to have to be much more, uh, you know, uh, much more uh, systematic with the notation. So here, the notation was sort of amalgamated. That k. That I, uh, that I write down here, and the h and the d3i, we're going to have to specialize this to each piece of the boundary. Because what I really mean here uh, when I write this expression for the extrinsic curvature inside, uh, you know, for the, for the full dv boundary, is the extrinsic curvature of the boundary as a whole when that boundary is embedded in space-time. But if I break down the boundary into those two pieces and b, well, now I'm going to have to be more specific with my notation. When I talk about the piece of the boundary sigma 2, well, k will stand for the extrinsic curvature of sigma 2 all by itself, 
which is you know the same you know, well which is going to be k denoted k uh, because it's the unified notation that I use for the extrinsic uh, extrinsic curvature of all the sigma t surfaces. So we're going to have a k term for sigma two. We're going to have a k term for sigma one. But here I have to be very careful about that term over here because k it's understood here in that notation amalgamated notation that we're talking about the extrinsic curvature defined in terms of a normal vector that's always directed outward. The normal vector that's directed outward is pointing toward the future for sigma 2, but it's pointing toward the past for sigma 1. But the way that I define the extrinsic curvature for all the sigma t surfaces, we always refer to the, out, to the future pointing normal. So there's going to be a minus sign here that I'm going to have to insert to reconcile that. And then, you know, the piece of B, uh, the, the piece of delta V that refers to B, well, now the notation for the extrinsic curvature has to be distinguished because the extrinsic curvature on B is that curly K that I introduced here. And the normal vector here is going to be different. And, uh, and that's the point. So the first step here in, uh, in writing an expression for the, uh, for the gravitational action is to be much more specific with the, uh, with the boundary term and make sure that we're clear on what K is supposed to mean in terms of all the stuff that we've done so far. So let's go back to the gravitational action. 16 pi times the action is going to be given by, well, the bulk term for the time being I'm going to keep alone. That we'll have to work on in a second, but right now I just want to make explicit what the boundary, uh, what the boundary terms stand for. So for sigma 2, uh, we get the usual k. Epsilon uh, is going to be minus 1 in this case because epsilon refers to the norm of the normal vector. And here the normal, you know, here the normal vector is time-like, so epsilon is going to be negative. So the first term I get is going to be an integral over sigma 2 of its extrinsic curvature, which is k, times uh, its metric, which uh, the, the metric determinant, with this, uh, which is h, and we're integrating that over the three-dimensional surface. We also have a term for sigma 1, but here's why I introduced the minus sign that we just talked about, because in the original notation, we were talking about the outward normal, which is past-directed on sigma 1, Whereas k, I reserved a notation for what I introduced here. This refers to a future pointing normal vector uh, on all the sigma t's. So I have to introduce this plus sign here, this additional minus sign to, uh, to, uh, to keep the notation um, uh, consistent. And then we have the, uh, the last term, which is going to be the part of the boundary that refers to B. For that, the normal vector is space-like, so epsilon is going to be positive. But now I've defined a very specific notation for this. So we get another plus term. We get an integral over B of the, extrinsic, the curly k, again, being challenged. The uh, induced metric on B is gamma. And we're integrating over D3z because those are the coordinates uh, that we're placing on B. So what we have to do is to you know, look at all this and rewrite everything in terms of a 3 plus 1 decomposition, where this guy will be written as a three-dimensional integral plus an integral over time. And these guys will be written, well, these guys will be left alone because those refer to uh, specific space-like surfaces within the foliation. But this guy also will be rewritten in terms of a time integral along with an integral over uh, theta, over the spatial variables associated with, with each ST surface. So we're going to work on the bulk term first and, uh, and see where that leads us. So we're going to leave this behind for now and just uh, go through the, uh, the task of evaluating the, the bulk integral. Okay, so I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to keep everything on the board, but I'm going to try. Okay, we're going to need a 3 plus 1 decomposition for, uh, for the Ricci scalar. 
And what I mean by that is what I meant before when we were doing the gauss kudatsi type stuff, where we say that the, uh, you know, the full space-time curvature in the, in the, uh, the four-dimensional space-time can be expressed in terms of quantities that live on a hypersurface. So that was the decomposition of the Riemann tensor, for example, the bulk Riemann tensor, in terms of an intrinsic Riemann tensor on a hypersurface, plus terms involving the square of the extrinsic curvature. So we've done that. We've worked this all out. And in fact, if you go back to the notes where I do all of this in Gaussian normal coordinates, uh, you'll see something that, well, I, 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 you know, I haven't given you the full listing of equations, but uh, there's enough there in your notes to, uh, to be able to derive the next equation that I'm going to write down, which is basically the application to the Ricci tensor to all those gauss kudatsi equations that we wrote down for the Riemann tensor. So you just continue to take contractions. And, uh, and you'll end up with the following equation that describes how the bulk curvature can be broken up into uh, an intrinsic three-dimensional curvature and square, uh, you know, square terms in the extrinsic curvature and then something extra. So let me just write down what the, um, what the relationship is. I won't derive it. Um, Again, the claim is that you can find what you need to derive this in the lecture notes, or you can look at uh, the discussion I have of this in the book. Uh, the derivation is provided in the book. So uh, in the first instance, the, the four-dimensional curvature can be related to the three-dimensional curvature on the hypersurface itself. That's what I mean by R with a 3 on top. There's going to be terms involving the square of the extrinsic curvature on each hypersurface. So there's going to be KAB, KAB term. And then there's going to be a k-squared term. But then there's a whole bunch of additional terms that are pretty important here. And I'm going to write them down. Uh, we have the covariant derivatives of the normal vector minus the normal vector times its four-dimensional divergence. All of this covariantly uh, differentiated with respect to alpha. Uh, so here's the point. If you remember what we did when we were working this out in, uh, in, uh, in Gaussian normal coordinates, you'll remember that some components of the Riemann tensor could be expressed in terms of components of the intrinsic uh, curvature on the manifold, and uh, we had k-squared terms. And some components didn't have anything more than this because those components didn't involve anything relate, you know, relating to the second derivatives of the metric evaluated on the surface. But there were some components that involved things like that, you know, second time derivatives of the metric evaluated on the hypersurface. And uh, when we wrote down the gauss kudatsi equations, we were looking at those components for which there wasn't you know, uh, to uh, second derivative terms, so they look prettier that way. But the remaining components, the one that we left out, actually have those terms, those terms, but also higher derivative terms. Those higher derivative terms basically can be packaged into this expression right here. And you know that they're second derivative terms because here I have first and second derivatives of the normal vector. And in, you know, Gaussian normal coordinates, it's these guys that can be related to, uh, to the second time derivatives of, uh, of the metric. So that's something we didn't uh, you know, work out uh, in the lectures. But again, uh, that's something you can find fully worked out in, um, in the book. And again, you can go back to your expressions in, uh, Gaussian, uh, in um, Gaussian normal coordinates and convince yourself that you can repackage all those extra terms into this neat formulation right here. So that is the uh, 3 plus 1 decomposition of the four-dimensional Ricci uh, scalar in terms of a three-dimensional Ricci scalar that describes the Ricci curvature of each sigma t surface, the extrinsic curvature, and then some stuff that's left over. Uh, the 3 decomposition of root g, that's something we saw before. It's going to be the lapse. It's going to be root h. And, of course, uh, the d4x will decompose into a dt d3y if I'm choosing x alpha to be uh, given by t and y a, which is what I'm doing here. 
And, uh, well, those are the ingredients. What I can do then is to plug this into here and see what we get. And of course, we're, we're going to get a whole new generation of boundary terms because this is a perfect, you know, this is a total divergence. So we're going to turn that into a whole new bunch of surface integrals and we'll see what happens with those. So as you, as I told you this morning, uh, we'll be dealing with boundaries until we, you know, drown in them uh, in this calculation. So let's see, I think I'll get rid of these guys here. So let's look at this integral again, the bulk integral. The bulk in integral of the four-dimensional Ricci scalar is given by, well, first we're going to have all the stuff that will stay in the bulk. We're going to get, so 3R plus KA, B, K, A, B minus k squared, and we're integrating in the bulk, so we're going to get a, sh uh, we're going to get a lapse function, we're going to get a, a square root of h, and we're going to get a dt d3y. So that's going to be the first part of the bulk integral. And then we're going to get all of this, which, because it's a pure divergence, will give us a whole bunch of boundary terms. So this we're integrating over V, and we get the boundary terms that come from the second set of terms. And we have these guys. And this is integrated over the surface element of the full boundary. Now, okay. Well, let's deal with the boundary term, see what it gives us. Let's do it. So again, we break down uh, delta V in terms of sigma 1, sigma 2, and B. So let's work it out all in turn. So if we're working on sigma 2, uh, the surface element on sigma 2 is going to involve uh, the normal vector, which is N. But uh, if you remember from, uh, from the notes or from the discussion in the book, uh, the relationship between the, uh, you know, the, the sigma, uh, you know, there's always an epsilon that goes in here. And in this case, the epsilon is negative. So this guy is actually directed in the direction opposite to n. Uh, but that's just, you know, stuff that we talked about a long time ago. So the surface element uh, in this case is given by this which means that the bulk integral is going to be the, sorry, the, uh, this piece of the boundary integral is going to be an integral over sigma 2. And uh, we're going to get, well, what's inside the integral. And that multiplies n alpha, and that multiplies square root of h d3y. All right. This will simplify. We have n alpha, n alpha differentiated in direction of beta. And then uh, n alpha multiplying n alpha gives us a minus 1. So this gives us that. This is zero because n alpha is a normalized uh, vector. And this guy here is half the derivative of n alpha n alpha in the direction of n. So I can rewrite this as half of n alpha n alpha differentiated with respect to beta. And of course, this is a constant, so there's no derivative. And uh, therefore, it's zero. That 
that guy over here is the metric multiplying n alpha and beta. The metric can be decomposed into uh, you know, a piece along n and a transverse piece. The, the piece along n gives no contribution for exactly the same reason I just stated here. So this is the same thing as h alpha beta multiplying n alpha uh, differentiated. This can be uh, re-expressed in terms of h a b times the tangent vectors, which is recognized as h a b times k a b. And all of this stands for the trace of the extrinsic curvature. So what do we get in the end? We get that this piece here on sigma 2 evaluates to 2 the integral of the extrinsic curvature on, uh, on sigma 2 integrated over sigma 2. Do you see something nice happening? We get this over here. And we had that over here. Those two things will cancel out. So there's redemption here yet. Uh, we generate all sorts of terms, but some of them end up canceling out. And the other ones will end up packaging themselves into very nice uh, uh, things. So uh, bear with me. We're going to go through that. Um, and it's all going to look pretty in the end. OK. On sigma 2, we get something that cancels the previous contribution. On sigma 1, we're going to get exactly the same thing, but with the extra minus sign that we always find for sigma 1. On sigma 1, I won't repeat the steps here. But on sigma 1, uh, you know, again, it's a matter of choosing the right sign here, because in this context, we're always talking about the outward normal. But on sigma 1, we continue to use the, uh, the, um, the future directed normal vector. So on sigma 1, what we get is that the boundary term evaluates to minus 2 sigma 1 k h d3y. And again, we get something that cancels the sigma 1 uh, uh, integral from before. So in this massive collection of boundary terms, we find that uh, all the ones that refer to sigma 1 and sigma 2, in fact, go away. And the only boundary uh, integral that will survive is the one that's on B. All right, let's do B. Uh, let's, do, uh, yeah, let's do the calculation on B this time. So we're still over here. I'm still evaluating this boundary term, and I've done sigma 2, I've done sigma 1, but now we have to do b. So on b, now my directed surface element is going to be directed along r alpha, and uh, the induced metric on b is gamma ij, so the determinant is going to be uh, you know, gamma. And I'm integrating over D3Z. So I'm going to write it in this form first. So the integral, uh, now we still pick up the minus 2. We have an integral over B. So what's inside the integral? We have an alpha uh, differentiated. And we get minus an alpha times the divergence of N. All of that is multiplying r alpha minus gamma d3z. Again, this simplifies. n is orthogonal to r, so we get rid of that term. And uh, the other term, let's see what I want, uh, what do I want to do with this? Well, let me write it first. The only term inside the integral is going to be r alpha and alpha differentiated and beta, and uh, we have the rest of it. I want to write this in a, in a different form. What I'll do is to take this. I'm going to combine the derivatives in this way. 
and then I'm going to make up for the difference by taking the derivative of r in the direction of the normal vector. And I'm going to get rid of this because, again, r is orthogonal to n. So what do I get? I get that this piece of the boundary term is going to be given by 2 r alpha differentiated with respect to beta. All of this evaluated in normal direction and uh, integrated over b. So, let me combine what we've got so far. We, uh, we go back over here, and now we have an expression for the gravitational action that's going to involve uh, a new uh, bulk term that's given by what has disappeared. So we have the bulk term that's given by, um, well, I'll write it in a different form this time. I'm going to say that, you know, the bulk integration involves an integration from T1 to T2 over time. And then we have a spatial integration over each sigma T. And that involves what was left over in the bulk integral before, the three-dimensional Ricci scalar, the squared terms in the extrinsic curvature, and the procedure is that we integrate over each uh, sigma t surface, and then we move up along the stack by integrating over time. So that's a, that's a clean expression for, uh, for the bulk term. And now the boundary term from what we had before, we got rid of the sigma 1 and sigma 2 terms, and here we had the b term that will combine with the new b term we just found, uh, that B term also had a nice factor of 2 in it. So, uh, so the B integral, I'm going to leave it in this notation, will involve the, you know, the curly K over here and then what we just computed, which is this, this derivative of R in the normal direction. Okay, well, now it's starting to look like something. Uh, we're going to do something a little bit better. I'm just going to remember what the, uh, what the uh, definition was for uh, the curly extrinsic, cur uh, extrinsic curvature. I'm going to go back to that definition over here, and you'll see that, interestingly enough, that involves also R differentiated. So the B term will uh, package itself, as I said, in something uh, that, that's going to look quite nice. So bear with me, we're almost there. Questions? Yep. Yes, we do. Thank you. Right here. Okay, so curly K is the trace of the full extrinsic curvature, which is defined, as I have on the board, by the derivatives of the R vector projected to, uh, to the B surface. Um, which I can re-express as R alpha semicolon beta times this combination of things that we've seen before. We've seen it up here. So this stands for R alpha differentiated. And using the completeness relation, I can express this as G alpha beta uh, minus R alpha R beta. 
and now it's starting to look like something. This bracket over here is R alpha differentiated times G alpha beta plus N alpha N beta minus R alpha R beta. And that's also something we've seen before. I don't know if I still have it. No, I think I've lost it. Do you recognize this? What was that? It's sigma alpha beta. This is by another set of completeness relations. This is basically the, uh, the metric on, uh, on each ST, which foliates sigma T, of course, which foliates T. And one last step on this. We take the sigma AB out, we end up with the normal vector to, uh, to ST differentiated and projected down to ST. We end up with that two-dimensional extrinsic curvature that we talked about a while back. And now it gets really nice because what we're talking about here all along in this boundary term is the two-dimensional trace of the two-dimensional extrinsic curvature of ST embedded in sigma T. After all this effort, now we're starting to see a gravitational action that's starting to look uh, pretty. Extrinsic curvature that you wrote down is the extrinsic curvature viewed from the whole space. Uh, at this stage, it's packaged itself into a two-dimensional extrinsic curvature when I embed ST in sigma T. So at this stage, uh, even though uh, you know we started out with an embedding of B in space-time, it sort of all naturally evolves to uh, something that's compatible, or you know, that that's uh, that's you know along the lines of the 3 plus 1 decomposition. So it's really a two-dimensional extensive curvature for each two-surface embedded in each three-surface along the foliation. So it's pretty remarkable the way it all you know, uh, happens like that. So what do we have at this stage? Well, we have that the gravitational action is going to be involving a time integral between sigma 1 and sigma 2. And inside the time integral, we're going to get each hypersurface integration on each sigma t. And in addition to that, so at this stage, of course, I'm going to break this down into a dt and a d2 uh, sigma, and I'm going to remember that this guy is equal to elapsed function times uh, square root of sigma, uh, and d3z, of course, will end up being dt d2 sigma, d2 theta. Uh, so, you know, buried in here, there's, uh, there's a time integral that I've already extracted. The rest of it is going to be an integral over ST, which is now a closed two-dimensional surface uh, bounding sigma T. And what I get from all of this is the two-dimensional trace uh, of the two-dimensional extrinsic curvature. Uh, I get a factor of the shift, uh, sorry, the lapse. I get little k. I get square root of sigma. And I get d2 theta. 
So a bulk term and a boundary term, now the bulk term refers to each sigma t surface, the boundary term refers to each, uh, each st surface, and I get the full action by integrating all of these guys uh, moving up along the stack by integrating over time. Yep? Uh, little k has nothing to do with sigma 1 and sigma 2, remember? Sigma, you know, little k is, uh, it, you know, refers to, uh, it's defined on st and only on st. All right. Oh, we're, uh, we're only looking at b. We're looking at b, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So that is the form of the gravitational action that's, uh, you know, that's conducive to, uh, to, uh, to extracting the Hamiltonian to define canonical momenta and, uh, and various things like that. Sorry, but didn't you just throw away the boundary values of the integral? Ah, yes, very good. I was just going to say something about that. When we got started, uh, so when we talked about the gravitational action uh, last week, uh, well, I think I've lost it by now. Um, so we talked about the need for a boundary term, but we also uh, talked about the need to uh, to uh, to regularize this by uh, by you know, inserting a k naught term, a, a reference term into into our boundary integral to make sure that the action for flat space time uh, you know, ends up being zero and that the action for Schwarzschild space time, for example, or any other asymptotically flat space time, uh, you know, uh, to make sure that those actions are well defined, uh, give you a finite number as opposed to an infinite number as it would if you didn't have that k naught term. So of course, I've dropped it here. I've dropped it today. I didn't come back to that. Uh, I could have kept it. I should have kept it, probably. Uh, the point is that, well, if you drop it, you can always reinsert it where appropriate. And we're going to do that not right now, because I don't want to do it right now, but at some point we'll do it uh, when we start looking at the value of the gravitational Hamiltonian for solutions. But uh, we can reinsert it here. So that k is really you know, something that should be expressed as little k minus k naught. So basically, all the stuff that happened for big k uh, ends up happening for k naught as well. And, uh, and you know, in the end, all of that repackages itself in terms of a subtraction for little k as opposed to big k. It just, you know, it just works out like that. So you can go through all of this again if you wish, if you're, you know, if you're masochistic. Uh, you go through this again with the boundary term inserted, and you verify that in the end you end up with, uh, with uh, this, uh, you know, boundary term at the level of little k instead of, um, instead of big k. Just to uh, make it explicit, this k is really the 2D extrinsic curvature on st embedded in sigma t. D3y, yes, thank you. Yep. Okay, uh, I'm going to keep talking for just a few minutes. I think we worked hard enough today. I don't want to push you uh, beyond this and start uh, calculating the, uh, the, uh, the Hamiltonian from this. But the rest of the story is, uh, is, uh, is much shorter and involves much less effort. So when we uh, come back to that next week, we're, we're going to see that, well, the hard work was done already, and the rest of the story is actually pretty simple. Now, uh, but we can start thinking about this a little bit just to, uh, you know, just to anticipate what might happen. Um, when, um, when we, so here we have an action that's expressed in a way that we want to extract a Hamiltonian because it's expressed in a way that incorporates the three plus one uh, decomposition that we needed to, you know, that we need to to uh, to incorporate, you know, even at the level of a scalar field theory, something that we talked about this morning. So we have an action that's really now compatible for uh, 
for extracting the canonical momentum and, the, uh, and, uh, and once we have the canonical momentum associated with the metric, we can uh, do the rest of the you know, procedure and get the Hamiltonian density and then the, the full Hamiltonian. The only complica complication with respect to uh, what we did this morning is the fact that now we have a bulk term. Sorry, we have a bulk term, but we also have a surface term into our action, which means that, well, we know, uh, you know, we know that this is going to be given, you know, this is going to be the expression for the Lagrangian density for, uh, for GR, uh, but this is something extra that we're going to have to account for. So there's some slight complications that arise from this, but in the end, it's not going to be uh, a big deal because let's think of what's required for, uh, for the canonical momentum. The canonical momentum in GR, uh, I call it PAB uh, instead of pi AB because pi's, you know, there are pi's all over the place here, so it would be confusing to, uh, to keep referring to the momentum as uh, P, uh, as pi. But PAB is going to be defined to be as, you know, roughly speaking, is the Lagrangian, uh, it's the derivative of the Lagrangian density with respect to H dot AB, H dot, H dot AB being defined as the Lie derivative of HAB in the direction of the flow vector. So those are the uh, elements of the construction. Well, there's going to be, you know, minus signs and various things uh, going on, but I think it's pretty clear, at least intuitively, that the Lie derivative of the induced metric is going to be related to the extrinsic curvature, the three-dimensional extrinsic curvature. So there are additional factors, and there's, you know, there's trace terms and things like that, but next week we're going to find that, well, what we really mean by the time derivative of the metric here is going to be, of course, the Lie derivative of the metric. That's something that is uh, relatable to, uh, to the extrinsic curvature. So when we take a partial derivative of our Lagrangian density with respect to h dot, we're going to end up taking partial derivatives with respect to the extrinsic curvature, the three-dimensional extrinsic curvature. And we see that they occur here and they occur here. So we will compute those partial derivatives, and that will tell us what the canonical momentum is for gravity. The boundary term involves an extrinsic curvature, but it's a different extrinsic curvature that's independent from this guy over here. So the boundary term does not contribute to the canonical momentum because we're talking about very different extrinsic curvatures referring to very different hypersurfaces. This refers to the boundary of sigma t. This refers to sigma t itself embedded in, uh, in, uh, in the full four-dimensional space-time. So the point here is that when we construct a canonical momentum, we don't need to worry about this. We take the partial derivative as if we didn't have a boundary term, and that just follows the normal recipe that we talked about this morning. So in that context, the boundary term doesn't, uh, doesn't introduce complications. The rest of the story is to say that the uh, you know, Hamiltonian density is going to be the canonical momentum multiplying by h bar a b. Of course, there's going to be summations, and the indices will have to be placed correctly here, minus the Lagrangian density. So this will involve stuff that we get only from the bulk term. This involves the bulk term as well, but it also involves now the boundary term as well. The point of the boundary term is that it's going to appear in the Hamiltonian density only through this guy over here. And in fact, uh, we will introduce a minus sign. So we'll find that exactly the same boundary term appears in the Hamiltonian with an extra minus sign because it only occurs because of the subtraction over here. It's not you know, appearing in, uh, in the first collection of terms here. So this collection of terms will involve messy stuff involving, you know, uh, you know Ks and, and things like that. Uh, so there'll be a bulk term coming from all of this and, you know, the bulk term coming from that. And, but the boundary term will just basically come along for the ride. And the boundary term 
will be exactly the same boundary term we had before. No changes uh, are required except for this minus sign. So next week, it will all come together, and we'll have our Hamiltonian, and then we'll start you know, playing some <coughs> interesting games like you know, taking the Hamiltonian, evaluating for solutions to the field equations, and seeing what we, you know, what we can recognize from all of that. So, any questions before we quit? Yep. Um, can you just remember the silly question? But back at the beginning when we had um, our volume group and the uh, boundary, um, the cusp where we glue on the, the top and bottom to yep. the cylinder, um, those would have, uh, those would be places of diverging extrinsic curvature, correct? Yep. So, we're not including those in our integration. Okay, uh, that's a good question. Um, so, let's see, do I still have that picture? I don't. So we have sharp uh, features in our construction. I realize that the, the edges would be as a zero compared to the rest, but right. I'm not sure that. Well, it, it's a bit, it, it's a bit uh, delicate because here we have, you know, we have edges over here where uh, the normal vector goes from being space-like to being time-like, and there's a discontinuity. And that's dangerous because if you start taking derivatives to compute extrinsic curvatures, you will get divergences. So these would be corners where the extrinsic curvature would be, uh, would be diverging. Uh, and that's potentially, uh, that's potentially dangerous, and it takes a little bit of analysis to, to convince anybody that, uh, in fact, well, yes, they are diverging, but you're also integrating that over a, a set of you know, measure zero. And in fact, what you find is that in the end, uh, that, you know, that divergence, those singularities don't contribute. One way to see it is to say that, well, you know, this is a bit artificial. What I could have done is to round it, you know, I could have rounded off those corners and, and regularized this at the level of the construction. I didn't have to have those sharp features built in. I could have smoothed things over. And if you smooth things over, well, basically now you remove the singularities, but you're not changing the fact that the portion here that's null is still a set of measure zero, and is still don't contribute. So it's not completely obvious. I mean, this, this is something that you know people have worked out. Very careful people have worked out and convinced themselves that well, there are no there are no worries about these things. But it's an issue that, of course, you know, needs to be worked out by somebody at some point, so that we can all forget about it after that. Did you have a question? No. Uh, we haven't seen it for a while, but it will reappear. So there, there's going to be shift. Uh, there's going to be a shift vector over here. There's going to be a shift vector over here. So they, they will they will reemerge, but it's not appearing in uh, in the gravitational action. It will be appearing in in the Hamiltonian, but not in the action. I have a question. So if I look at this Hamilton, the very first term with the uh, R three. Yep. So three dimensional Ruby tensor. So I can basically play the same game as we have done before and then get it down to one dimension lower and use the gauss kodashi and then mm -hmm. how are we so sure that the term with the, the last term uh, with, with the close integral with this st would survive? I mean, so you have in mind that uh, what you, we could choose to do is to foliate each sigma t surface into a bunch of nested surfaces like that? Yes. And we could do the composition like this, and eventually end up all the way uh, over to ST. Yes. Um, we certainly could do it. I'm not sure how useful it could be, uh, but I think. Um, Well, I'm guessing that probably would see that some of the cancellations occur in pretty much more or less the same way. Uh, but yeah, so but I, I've never seen it done like this, so I don't think it would be very useful to, to, to do it like this. So we're happy enough just to have a three plus one decomposition. We don't need to do a you know two plus one plus one or one plus one plus one plus one. That would be just overkill. Uh, although you know. If your space-time has symmetries, it might be useful actually to take into account those symmetries into a decomposition. So, for example, if you have spherically symmetric space-times, you can do a two plus two decomposition that can be turned into a two plus one plus one decomposition because you have this two-dimensional built-in symmetry, uh, you know, uh, around the spheres. And people have come up with formalism to do these things because you know 
uh, having introduced the decomposition, you can write down the field equations in a way that you know really uh, incorporates the symmetries in an obvious way, so it, it, it turns out to be pretty. But at this level, uh, we don't have symmetries, or at least we don't suspect that we have symmetries beyond what we have, and uh, we just leave it at that. Yeah. Other questions? Well, all of this was hard work, so I think those last two weeks have been pretty heavy in, 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 uh, in, uh, in calculational details. Uh, if you think it's hard, uh, you know, take pity on me because it's much worse to do it on the board, believe you me. Uh, it's very cruel to do something on the board. Uh, I'm talking about myself. Uh, so it's, it's much more painful for me, you know, if you believe that. Uh, so, uh, so next week we're going to you know, continue with the Hamiltonian, but now the technical details are going to be uh, much easier. And, uh, and then when we go into black holes, of course, there's still going to be some technical details. But again, I think it's going to be breezier. The amount of calculational labor is going to be much smaller. And I think we'll have a bit more fun in the remaining weeks compared to those heavy-duty uh, couple of weeks where we had to really invest a lot. So thank you.